not only on the screen, but it's in uh, printed form inside your bulletin if you have it there. Uh, So wherever you go to read it, let's read it now. Philippians chapter 2, verse 19 through to chapter 3, verse 11. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. For everyone looks out for his own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. You know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope therefore to send him as soon as I see how things are going with me and I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. Welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and honour men like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help you could not give me. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh, for it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. This is God's word. This morning let us pray as we come to look at it. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we adore you and we praise you. Thank you for this word this morning. Lord, by your spirit, give me unction and freedom as I preach and proclaim your truth today. And again, by your spirit, please work within the hearts of each one of us according to our need that you might teach, rebuke and encourage us and cause us to be conformed more and more into the image of your Son and our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. I know it's easy to look back on things and think about how they used to be in the old days and paint a rose-coloured picture of the past. But I was thinking this week, and I shared a little in the BPC bulletin, how my own grandparents once told me that during the Great Depression of the 1930s, it was a common thing for families to welcome complete strangers into their homes and to give them a meal. It was a time of national crisis. People were facing ruin because the economy had collapsed and many businesses were forced to close. And most people in those days were too ashamed to take the money the government offered. Instead, men would travel all over the land looking for work because nobody wanted to be called a dull bludger. It was a matter of personal dignity. And I have a few slides for you just there that I I found uh, in preparing today. We don't want trouble. We just want a fair living for our families. And who will help me get a job? I do not want charity. It was a very hard time. 
and this was the condition of many people, certainly here in Australia. And in the next slide as well, you can see the impact that it had on families who lost their homes and had to build their own shelters and the poverty that they lived in in the 30s, I think we have little understanding of today and how people and especially churches and Christians and, and people generally, but, but the whole society really, was often uh, needing to feed people, including children, uh, because the situation was so dire. Compare that to the situation we are living in today. These days, people at all levels of society wrought the system. Much of the social network structures that we enjoy today were set up in those days and now people take it for granted and there's a a spirit of entitlement that people have that when the government gives you money, of course you take it because I deserve it. How things have changed. We are so much richer than we were 90 years ago but we are so much poorer as well. We've lost our ethics. We've lost our sense of innocence. I think we're losing our soul as a nation. I mean, why would anyone think it's a good idea to ban people from using words like mother and father as is happening at the moment? Or to ban Christians from praying as we've seen in Victoria? Or to pass a law as South Australia did just this week that allows abortion until birth? And this is the land that we live in. This is Australia in 2021. It's completely insane. But this is a spiritual battle and some of these changes have been creeping up on us for years and I suppose many Christians have just assumed that uh, somebody will look after it. But nobody has. And so we've witnessed a slow decline in our society and Christian values We've witnessed the demoralisation of our society and by that I mean the demoralisation, the removing of the morals that used to found the values of our society, the breakdown of families, the legalisation of same-sex marriage, uh, all these issues that seem to be dovetailing in together in order to overturn the structures of our society. Even the overtaking of our education system by activists who hate our culture really and are doing great harm to our kids. These are troubling times and as parents and as Christians we need to be aware so that we can respond to these things because as I say this is a spiritual battle and we need to respond as Christians with prayer and with confidence in God's word and with practical demonstrations of God's love I guess what I'm saying this morning is that taking care of one another in that strong, godly, Christian sense has never been more important. Bureaucrats, big government and the welfare state will never replace the genuine loving care of God's people. In fact, I think this is an opportunity for us as Christians to rediscover a kind of way of living that we had more in the past and which is going to become very much more important in the future. So practically speaking then, what does it mean for us as Christians to care for others? This is the challenge for today. Last week Paul encouraged us to shine like stars in the universe as we hold out the word of life to a crooked and depraved generation. Well, there we are right here, right now. I'm not saying the world was perfect 90 years ago, not at all. But at least as Christians saw these problems arising, When they saw the need, they responded to it. Many Christians really did shine like stars in their communities. They rolled up their sleeves and they got on with the job of taking care of one another. In fact, they did turn the depression into a gospel opportunity. And I was reflecting on this, I think by contrast, I mean, who of us today would willingly, willingly and freely open our homes to a complete stranger and make a seat for them at the table and share our meal with them and perhaps even offer them a bed for the night. If someone knocked on your door, if someone knocked on my door, I'm not sure that I'd be ready to do that. It just doesn't happen anymore because we have lost as a society, as a nation, that level of trust in the wider community that we once had. And that's very sad then, as I say, maybe God is preparing us to shine again as we renew our love and care for one another 
and as we hold out that word of life to a crooked and depraved generation. After all, it's the same darkness that holds people captive now as it was then and it's the same light of Christ that can set them free. The gospel has not changed. The gospel has never changed and we declare that Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. So today we're going to learn about taking care of one another. For God's word teaches us that we are responsible for one another's well-being emotionally, physically and spiritually. We are responsible for one another's well-being and that's where the gospel comes in because we, as Christians, we want to invite people from every tribe and tongue and nation to join with us in this unique Christ-centred community of loving care that is called the church. And may God help us to be more and more reflective of those qualities as his people in Burwood today. I've only got two points today. First of all, in verses 19 to 21, it'll be Timothy and Epaphroditus who guide us as we learn about taking care of one another's welfare. Then in chapter 3, verses 1 to 11, Paul will focus on safeguarding the gospel in order to gain Christ. I'll call this second part of our message, taking care of one another's faith. So that's our roadmap. Taking care of one another's welfare and taking care of one another's faith because God's word teaches us to be responsible for one another's well-being emotionally, physically and spiritually. So as soon as you start looking at today's passage, we come to chapter 2, verse 19. You can see how important this is to the Apostle Paul. It jumps straight out at you, this concern that he has for the welfare of others. Look at verse 19. Paul says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. Do you see that? He takes a genuine interest in your welfare. Uh, Timothy was an incredibly important person in Paul's life. Perhaps he, even the most important person after the Lord Jesus Timothy was special to Paul. In fact, he was like a son to Paul, as we'll see in a moment. And Paul is so concerned for the welfare and well-being of the Philippian church and he's so hungry for news of their circumstances and their well-being that he decides to send Timothy to go to them to get news to bring back to him. Paul has the Philippians in his heart. In fact, he has all people in his heart. But he loves the Philippians dearly, as we've seen. And he really needs to know because he's in jail there and and he needs to know how are they going? How are they feeling? How are they progressing in the faith? What needs do they have? What prayer points can he pray for them? As you can see, it's all about taking care of one another's welfare in Christ. But who was Timothy? Let's learn a little more more about Tim. Timothy was a young man from Lystra in what is now modern day Turkey. His mother was a Jewish woman who became a Christian but his dad was a Greek. So it was a mixed marriage effectively, a mixed marriage. Mother Jewish, father a Greek and Timothy would have been considered illegitimate by Jewish standards because it was a mixed marriage. Not an easy burden to carry. Also, I get the feeling that in in terms of his home life, when you look at other passages about Timothy, that Timothy's dad didn't stay, if I can put it that way. Timothy's dad didn't stay. So, Timothy appears to have been raised by his mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois, both of whom had become Christians. Timothy was probably converted by Paul along with uh, the family there on his first missionary journey to Lystra and then Timothy would have joined Paul when Paul came back to Lystra on his second missionary journey. We think that's how it would have happened. And then at some point Timothy has been adopted by Paul so that Paul becomes to Timothy a father in the faith and this bond of fellowship and love between the older Paul and the younger Timothy unites them together in an extraordinary friendship. Timothy worked for Paul, alongside Paul, with Paul under Christ in the ministry of the gospel. They were servants together of Christ, father and son in the faith. And Timothy is often mentioned as a messenger between the congregations 
as is the case in our passage today. And you'll know that there are two letters that Paul writes to Timothy that are in our Bibles, First and Second Timothy, both written as words of encouragement by Paul to his son in the faith. And now Paul is about to send Timothy off to Philippi just as soon as Paul finds out how his own case will turn out, whether for life or for death. Because as we've seen before, Paul isn't very much concerned about his own death. He knows that God is in control of his life and he's far more interested in using what time he has for the benefit of others rather than fretting about things that he can't control. So today's passage is a lesson about faith. It's certainly that. But it's also teaching us to have the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. Remember that wonderful passage we looked at last week? That in Christ and his love for mankind, Jesus looked not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others, to our interests and our needs. And so we see that same attitude formed in the mind and behaviour of Paul and also of Timothy. So today's passage is not simply about faith, it's also about friendship and it's about caring for one another, the outworking of our faith in these practical ways in our lives. Jesus was pleased to be called a friend of sinners and Paul also takes this same attitude and he urges others to do likewise. What we're looking for here is a full-blooded commitment to walking the talk, walking together and walking with Christ. We want to take the truth that we have been loved by God in Christ in this extraordinary way and we want to turn it around and share it with others. We want to be drawn together as a church, unified in Christ, caring for one another and we want to extend that care to our neighbours and our community and our world. So here we have Paul and he's talking about his son in the faith, Timothy, And Paul says of Timothy that he has proved himself because as a son with his father he has served with me in the work of the gospel. That's in verse 22. Timothy has proved himself. He's taken up that same attitude of Christ Jesus and of Paul and he's willingly serving in the gospel ministry. He's a faithful friend and he genuinely cares for the welfare of the Philippians. It's on his heart, it's in his prayers. He's eager to go when Paul sends him. What then can we learn from Timothy today? Let's pause for a moment and think. What can we learn from Timothy? Well, most of all, I think we can learn what it means to take a genuine interest in one another's welfare. And that's a challenge. It's a great opportunity too, to take a genuine interest in one another's welfare. How are you going? Had a good week? How's How's your walk with the Lord? How can I pray for you? Is there anything you need? How can I take a genuine interest in your welfare? We can also see his commitment to the gospel. We can see his love for the church and his compassion for people. We can see his willingness to serve. And you add that to his cultural awareness and his Greek background as he goes with Paul around the Uh, the whole area that uh, the gospel was preached. When you put it all together, you really have a very special disciple and a very special friend. And Timothy is showing us then what it means to be a true friend in Christ. I think that's one of the things that we can really take from Timothy's example in our passage today. And then too, you have this other friend in Christ. His name's Epaphroditus and Paul talks of him in verses 25 to 30. Another remarkable friend. He too is a messenger. He's a friend of Christ and a friend of Paul. And he's been sent from Philippi to bring a gift of aid and assistance to the imprisoned apostle. And now that's caring for one another, isn't it? Taking that gift, being prepared to get on a boat, going across land and sea, no doubt, to go from Philippi all the way around uh, to Rome, where we think Paul was imprisoned. And Paul is deeply thankful for this act of kindness. It's not just a walk down the street. It's a journey of love. In verse 25, Paul describes Epaphroditus in this way. It's high praise 
and it reflects his care and concern for Epaphroditus. He calls him my brother, fellow worker and and fellow soldier who is also your messenger whom you sent to take care of my needs. You see this interconnecting of, of care that is so evident when you stop to see in our passage today. What a wonderful description of a friend, someone who cares for me, someone who cares for you. And this desire to take care of one another's needs really does run both ways, not only from Paul to the Philippians, but from the Philippians back to Paul. And Epaphroditus is the messenger of that Christ-honouring, loving care. Not only so, but Epaphroditus, Paul goes on to tell us, must have taken some considerable risks to undertake this missionary journey of care for Paul. We're not told exactly what happened on the way, but it's clear that he fell very sick. And Paul's account of his ordeal is quite moving. He says, indeed, he was ill, almost died. But God had mercy on him and not on him only but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow for after all imagine being in jail in Rome and having somebody wanting to bring a gift of care to you and then having him die. That would have added sorrow upon sorrow. And so Paul says therefore I'm all the more anxious to send him so that when you see him again you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. These people really care for one another. It's a network of care between Paul and Epaphroditus and Timothy and the church in Philippi. And you can see how Paul now knows that it's time for Epaphroditus to go back home now that he has recovered from whatever illness it was that he had. So it seems this is what is in Paul's mind. First Epaphroditus will travel back to Philippi. Then Timothy will follow with news of Paul. And last of all, Paul will come if it's God's will for him to do so. And perhaps they'll all be reunited in Philippi, God's will being done. The other thing I want to say about Epaphroditus before I move on is just summarising here, he knew the importance of his ministry. I don't know what he'd been doing in Philippi, but you imagine he would have had a job, he would have had family, he he would have had a life to live in Philippi, but he knew the importance of this ministry to take this aid and assistance to Paul. He understood the need. His heart was thankful for Paul and the ministry Paul must have had in his life. And so he travelled from Philippi to Rome where we think Paul was and he did it for free and he did it for Christ and he did it for the benefit and the blessing of his friend, the Apostle Paul. Never mind the cost or the inconvenience. Epaphroditus cared and because he cared he was willing to serve even to death And so Paul says down in verse 30, the last verse of chapter 2, again, Epaphroditus almost died for the work of the gospel, risking his life to make up for the help you Philippians could not give me. This is not a criticism, it's just saying that Philippians are there, Paul's here, Epaphroditus is the one who must take this journey. And Paul is expressing his gratitude both to Epaphroditus and to the Philippians for the way they've shown care to Paul in his imprisonment in such a selfless way. Again, it's just this full-blooded commitment to walk the talk, to walk together and to walk with Christ that's so impressive and that overflows into this practical care that they have for one another. And it's being modelled in their lives, not only for their benefit when the letter was written, but for ours as well to learn from their example and to be encouraged to imitate them. They really cared. I mean, they really cared for one another. They cared for one another's welfare, emotionally, physically and spiritually. So to wrap up my first point for today, I thought I might turn it into a challenge for you and for me. And the challenge, which is a real challenge, is to be a true friend in Christ. Will you be a true friend in Christ? A friendship is as friendship does. And if you're a true friend in Christ, then your friendship will be a powerful demonstration of the gospel because your friendship is actually a a reflection and an overflowing of the friendship that you have with Christ. It is Christian friendship that is powerful and life-changing. We can all be friends And you don't have to be Christian to be a friend, but there's something special going on in these friendships and the way they're being lived out. 
just like Timothy and Paul and Epaphroditus, to be a Christian friend is to rejoice, first of all, in the Lord and through rejoicing in the Lord to undertake this ministry of care for one another, looking out for one another's emotional, physical and spiritual well-being. And may we then shine like stars in the universe as we hold out the word of life to a crooked and depraved generation. For that is, after all, true friendship, is to bring your friend into friendship with Jesus. Well, it's this spiritual well-being of his friends in Philippi that occupies Paul's thoughts in the last part of our passage today. And I've called this second part of our message, Taking Care of One Another's Faith. So as we turn to chapter 3, we begin to see for the first time in the letter of Philippians the troubles that the church was having. For they were having troubles. They were a church with many blessings, but they were not without their problems. And so Paul commends the Philippians, first of all, that they should continue to rejoice in the Lord, but then he also speaks of needing to safeguard their faith. So if you look at verse 1, he says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. That's an interesting word, a safeguard, a protective shield, a defensive strategy, a place where you can be safe and secure from the lies and deceptions of the enemy. Paul is taking care of his friend's faith. See, in Paul's day, a danger that they faced, I don't think we face quite the same one today, but we perhaps face it clothed in different garb, but the danger they had was the arrival of false teachers from a Jewish background who actually knew their Bibles really well, but they insisted that the law of Moses had to be kept even by Gentiles who had become Christians. So they wanted the Old Testament laws to continue unabated, Whether you were a Jew or not, you really had to become a Jew in order to be a Christian. This is how they thought. So these people were law-loving legalists. We call them Judaizers, but Paul called them dogs. And his language is about to get even worse in verse 2. He says, watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. These false teachers were really dangerous precisely because... They did know the content of the Old Testament very well. And they liked to call themselves the circumcision. But Paul, in his sarcastic turn of phrase in verse 2, a phrase that certainly has cut through, he calls them the mutilation. Not the circumcision, but the mutilation. I actually put up here for you, that's a circumcision knife. Okay, no anaesthetic. Think of which part of the body we're talking about here and imagine what mutilation would mean. It's enough to put any man off his lunch. But Paul, being a Jew, had a detailed working knowledge of the entire Old Testament system. And so he insists now that we as Christians are the true inheritors of Israel's relationship with God, not them. For by the power of the Holy Spirit we've been united with Christ and we've been circumcised in our hearts. Our hardness has been taken away so that we're now soft-hearted and caring and alive to the promises of God so that we, and not them, we are the true circumcision of God. He says in chapter 3, verse 3, For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Jesus Christ and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. Paul had every confidence, reason to have confidence in the law. He knew the law and he knew the privileges of the law. And yet he also knew, because he had encountered Christ, he knew that the law was only a shadow of the reality to come and that Jesus has become the fulfilment of the law for us. So then circumcision is really only an outward sign that marks a Jew in the flesh. It marked a Jewish man in the flesh. It was a sign of his belonging to the covenant community of Israel. If a Jewish man ever needed to prove his Jewishness, his identity, his belonging to the covenant community, he only needed to lift his robes and there you had it. The sign was there. It could be seen. 
But what was the use of this sign of circumcision unless it was joined to the inward reality of a genuine faith in God? For without faith, it was a sign that pointed to nothing. So now Paul is going to defend our living faith in the Lord Jesus. And I want you to look at the second part of verse 4. He says, If anyone else thinks he has reasonable confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. Oh, you can't beat Paul at this game, can you? I was circumcised when I was only a week old. I'm a racially pure Israelite. I have an unbroken family line. I belong to the tribe of Benjamin, who with Judah was the only other tribe that stayed loyal to the kingly line of David. I'm the best of the best. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. And I'm a Pharisee. And I persecuted the church. And I kept the law so well that I was technically blameless. If anyone was ever going to be saved by keeping the law, it was me. Do you want to keep playing this game? No. On the day when Paul met the risen Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus, his life was thrown upside down. And everything that he'd once placed so much value in was suddenly seen as worthless. It turned to sand and it fell from his hands. Paul had made an idol out of his legalistic righteousness, out of the very goodness that he was trying to live. He'd turned it into an idol and it was worthless before God because it was tainted with his own pride and arrogance and sin. So as he neared the city of Damascus with papers in his hands to arrest and persecute Christians, for that's why he was going, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. It was about midday. He fell to the ground. A voice said to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He cried out, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Can you imagine the kind of thoughts that must have been running through the Apostle Paul? Well, he wasn't the Apostle then. He was still Saul, wasn't he? Running through his head. For three days and nights he was blinded and he did not eat or drink anything. So it's true then. Jesus is alive. The disciples were right. Stephen was an innocent man. I've murdered innocent Christians in God's name. How could I have gotten it so wrong? And now from his prison cell, he wants to remind the Philippians, he wants to care for their faith because he knows the danger they're in from these false teachers who've come in and he he wants to remind them of the resurrection and the hope that the resurrection sets before us. I want you to come down to verse 7. Look at what Paul says here. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. Paul really did lose all his earthly possessions when he became a Christian. And yet he's saying here that it was more than worth it. It was more than worth it because now he was no longer playing with monopoly money. Jesus is the real thing. And so he says in verse 8, like our kids talked this morning, I consider them rubbish, rubbish. That I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes, that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and that is by faith. And what you need to imagine here is the loving arms of God embracing you and clothing you in the righteousness that is God's righteousness. And that's what Jesus is doing for you. It's not that you and I must please God by living the perfect life and attaining to heaven in that way, for we can't do it. But when we confess that we can't do it and we come to Jesus, 
we are enclosed in the caring, loving, life-saving arms of our Saviour. With Jesus, it's the real thing. When we come to Jesus, God responds to our rebellion in a most remarkable way. He cares for us. He cares for us. He meets us at our point of need. He cares for us. He cares for you. He doesn't rub our noses in our sin as he might do. He doesn't shame us with our past failures and indiscretions. He wraps us up in his mighty loving arms and he cares for us. He takes the penalty of all our sins. He cancels the debt that stood against us. He embraces us and then he rejoices in the fact that we've come home. Here you are, home again. I've always loved you. I care for you so much. And that's why Paul is so excited in the last part of our passage today. He says in verses 10 and 11, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. And Paul knows that he is greatly loved and that by God. And that's what he's sharing with us today. He's sharing his heart. He's sharing his experiences and his life and he's encouraging us to do likewise for one another. And so I pray that his heart's desire to know Christ and to love him more might also be our desire too because I know what that will mean for the way that we relate to one another. For out of that desire flows the willingness to care for others just as Christ has cared for us. As I look at our world today, I think we have become a far more heartless and uncaring society. But by God's grace, we as Christians, armed with the caring, loving gospel and the hope that it brings, we can make a real difference if we're willing. For today we've learnt, haven't we, that God's word teaches us to be responsible for one another's well-being, emotionally, physically and spiritually. So then, in conclusion, this is what true friends do for one another. We spur one another on to love and good deeds. We care for one another's welfare. We care for one another's faith. We uphold one another in prayer. We provide aid and assistance when it's needed. We send gifts of encouragement to one another. We serve together in the ministry of the gospel. We come to one another's side when we're sick. We visit one another in prison. We remind one another of God's promises and much more besides. I was talking to Jeremy just before the service today. I hope you don't mind me sharing. I wrote down a little point here. Jeremy's dad is not well at the moment and the family is making discussions and decisions about that. And yet Jeremy said to me, and I share it with you, knowing that we have the hope of the resurrection changes our care options. Knowing that we have the hope of the resurrection changes things. If you don't have the hope of the resurrection, if you don't have the gospel, your care options are narrowed, aren't they? Because this life is all you've got. But if you know Christ, if your family knows Christ, if your loved one knows Jesus, then your care options are enlarged. For this life is not the end and tomorrow will be a brighter day and though we may be separated for a time, we can look forward to being reunited together because the love of Jesus will bring us through, even death. And so my final thought for the day, which I thought I'd take from Proverbs 17:17, 17, 17, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. And may God bless us with that thought as we finish today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us now respond to God's word with a song.